Okay, so this is part two of the Venture Financing for Startups two-part video, which is part of a larger playlist called the Startup Legal Guide. It is so important that you understand the path ahead of you if you are going to start a startup, and that's what these videos are all about. Is it the most clickbaity topic? No, but nerd alert, I find it very exciting, and I'm excited for you. So understand what lays ahead, understand the adventure you are embarking upon. Here is part two of Venture Financing for Startups, Series B, Venture Debt, Bridge Financing, covered in this video. Enjoy. Oh, and please remember to click like and subscribe to help keep legal education accessible for entrepreneurs. Okay, goodbye. At Series B and beyond, I'm gonna kind of lump these in together. What you're dealing with is larger sums of money. As you get to kind of Series C and D, maybe if you are even getting close to unicorn status, meaning a privately held company, valued at over a billion dollars. You may no longer be working with venture capital firms exclusively. You might be working with, for example, private equity firms, even mutual funds. Some venture capital firms invest at each type of stage, each series. Some focus on a specific part of the startup life cycle. Some are just early stage. Some are later stage. Some will stay with you. Throughout. That's another good thing to understand when you are vetting your investors. And it also helps you figure out whom you should reach out to. If you're trying to raise Series A money, you're not going to want to waste your time reaching out to Series C firms right away, unless you're really thinking ahead, I guess. But even though the amounts of money are so much larger at Series B and beyond, the type of instrument is unlikely to change very much from Series A. Of course, every situation is different, but you're likely just to take essentially the same terms of convertible preferred stock that you have from Series A and then apply those to Series B and beyond just at different valuations. Also up for negotiation at these phases is whether you as a founder are receiving any sort of essentially a bonus or selling any of your personal stock to receive a chunk of personal money as a payout as part of these transactions that used to be less common, but from what I read, it is becoming more common these days. One of the other many moving pieces in all of this is your employee stock option pool and whether your equity is being diluted to create that. You'll have to think of that at each phase, particularly at the Series A stage, but elsewhere as well. The seed stage, Series A, always be thinking about the employee stock option pool and whether that's being taken out of essentially your share or the investor's share. At each of these stages, it is imperative that you maintain a really clean and clear cap table. So the cap table is essentially a chart that says who owns what portion of your business, whether they own common stock or preferred stock and how much of it. Please don't rely on like a spreadsheet to do this. There are good tools for managing it. Work with your lawyer, work with your accountant. There are also great tools like Carta and Pulley to keep track of all this. If you let it be a mess, it will come back to bite you. Don't let it become a mess. I'm not going to go into too much greater depth on the sort of post Series B stage because if you are at that stage in your business, congratulations. And uh, you are likely making really sophisticated decisions about whether to remain private if you're at Series D or if you're thinking about potentially an IPO and becoming publicly traded at that point. If you are watching this video and you're at that point, thanks for watching. Okay, so as promised, two more types of fundraising I want to talk about. These are not in the sort of sequential chronological order of series A, B, C, D. These are things you might encounter and tools that you might use. Arrows you might want in your quiver, regardless of the stage of your journey. I'm talking about bridge financing and venture debt. So first, bridge financing is what it sounds like. It's financing that will be a bridge for you between phases. So let's say that you are post Series A and you're trying to raise your Series B, but you can't quite get there. 
maybe your burn rate, meaning the, the amount of money you're using and losing each month is so high that you know the amount of time it will take you to raise a Series B is too long compared to the amount of time that you have left before you run out of money. Then you are likely to want some form of bridge financing. Now there are bridges of choice and bridges of necessity. You're in a much better position if you are looking for a bridge of choice and you are likely to get a lot better terms than if you are in the position of needing a bridge of necessity. A bridge of choice is where you're looking for just a little extra cash to make your balance sheet in a little better order, have a little better operations that'll just kind of get you over that hump to just receive a much better valuation at the next stage. So it may not be about, oh, we can't survive until Series B. It may be like, we're right on the precipice of getting a much better valuation. We're almost there. We just need a little more money to get us over that hump so that we can really show Series B investors what a great company we are and we'll have a much better valuation and then all our existing investors will be a lot happier. So it's not about survival, it's about valuation if you're looking at a bridge of choice. At a bridge of necessity, it's more like we don't think we can survive until the next round. So we need a bridge. We really need this bridge to get us from here to there. Regardless of whether you're in the position of needing a bridge of necessity or just wanting a bridge of choice, you're likely looking at a convertible note. So this is just like in your uh, seed stage financing. It's an instrument or a document that you're familiar with called a convertible note. So this is a loan essentially, but at your next stage of fundraising, which you are expecting since this is what that's a bridge to, uh, your loan will convert into more equity for your lender slash investor. So if you're looking at a bridge of choice, your terms are going to be better. If you're looking at a bridge of necessity, it's going to be a steep conversion rate. So the lender that gets you to your next series and helps your company survive until you raise your next round, that lender is going to get a much bigger chunk of your business at that next fundraising round. But again, if it truly is a bridge of necessity, you might not have a better option. Often the most common lender slash investor, and I call them lender slash investors because it's a convertible note, which means it's a loan that converts into equity. So they're lenders who convert into investors. But anyway, the most common type of bridge lender slash investor is someone from your existing investor pool because they want to help you get to that next stage because they want to see their money grow with your next stage of investment and your next higher valuation. Okay, so that's bridge financing. Let's talk about venture debt. Venture debt is just debt. It's loans, but there are certain lenders, certain banks that will uh, be a lot more likely to give you a loan, even if you're a very new company, as long as you are venture backed, because those lenders look at the venture money as being really uh, safe, and they also realize that venture capital investors are likely to reinvest, at least somewhat likely to reinvest, because they want to see their investments do well. So essentially, the lending bank in a venture debt type of transaction knows that they have somebody on their side, the venture capitalist, who also wants to see the company succeed, as opposed to just a typical small business where somebody's bootstrapping and then they've just been bootstrapping on their own for a while and then they look for a loan or maybe they're brand new and they're looking for a loan. They're essentially on their own. And sadly, banks don't look at a small business person who's on their own as being as safe an investment as a company that has some venture capitalists backing them. The other difference between venture debt and a typical bank loan is that they are more similar to, again, convertible notes where it might be a loan that then can convert at some point to equity for the bank or more specifically something called equity warrants, which are sort of similar to stock options in that they are a right for the bank to convert into equity at a certain percentage of the principal loan amount. This is what they call a 30,000 foot view of the whole thing. So we're going to have videos that go into greater depth at some of these stages and examine some of these terms a little more for you. If you have specific topics you'd like us to cover or subtopics you'd like us to cover, please drop them in the comments below.
Thank you very much for watching. Again, please remember to click like and subscribe to help keep legal knowledge free and accessible for small business owners.